and particle filters. There are all different tricks to, to, to carry out these inferences efficiently. Usually they work by making assumptions which are wrong, but make the math simple. Um, but at the end of the day, you can come back to these rules, which we're going to derive today in class, kind of from first principles. Uh, we're not really going to derive them because there's a lot of stuff in, in, in the chapter that uh, I recommend you meet. But I'm going to try to give you like the highlights, um, the, the most important things for, for, for how that happens. So how many of you guys did the reading? More than last time? That's good. I, I again encourage you to, to take a look at, at the, the two chapters that I assigned. The, the, the guy is brilliant. I think the writing is, is really pretty easy to follow and pretty fun if you like math. I don't know. I like math. And, and, uh, and, and really not, not my, I can lecture you all, all, all that I want. It's not really going to replace the experience of, of really trying to engage directly with this material um, by, by going through the math. OK. So, so to pick up from where we were, does anybody have any questions about anything before we kind of dig in? OK, no questions at all? Really? <laughs> What's that? What are quantitative rules? Yeah, so, so we talked about deductive reasoning last time. And it was, if A is true, then B is true. A is true, therefore B is true. And if A is true, then B is true. B is false, therefore A is false. And we worked, we actually implemented in class a little algorithm for proving new things about the, the world based on things that were already using these rules, basically, right? So, so we had this little search engine that just expanded and found all the possible things. Eventually, they're kind of the influence, right? So you just keep running and running and finding more and more true things about the world. But if you remember, um, we, we also talked about plausible reasoning, right? So what happens when you don't know the truth values of A, B, and C. So you want to ask if A, maybe you know that if A really is true, then B really is true, and B is true, and, and then you know B is true, somehow we think A becomes more plausible, okay? So instead of assigning a truth, so, so, so deductive logic says nothing about this, right? If B, does that make sense, everybody? Why don't we do that? Come, let's come up with an example of, of, uh, of, of a world where if A is true, then B is true. So, so there should be an implication. Um, B should be true, and A should be true. And then we'll come up with one where A, a different implication in rule where, where A is false. Yeah? If it's raining, then I'm wet. Yeah. There you go. And so, OK, so A is if it's raining. B is I'm wet. B is. So, so, so then we don't know in, 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 the, in the world right now. I could be wet because I jumped from the pool. I could be wet because somebody sprayed me with a hose. I could be wet because somebody threw a water balloon at me. And I could also be wet because it's raining, right? So, so deduct A could be true and A could be false. Um, however, there's something going on here where, if you remember the policeman example from, from the beginning, where you know, one of the reasons I could be wet is that it is raining. So somehow A really does seem like it's more plausible. So what we're going to talk about today is how, so, so here, like, like deductive logic, Arist Aristotelian logic just stops. It says nothing. It could be true. It could be false. I can't tell you. What we're going to do is, is come up with quantitative rules where we're going to assign numbers representing our degrees of belief. And those are going to be probabilities. And so instead of saying, you know, we don't know, like, we're still going to say, just like deductive logic, we're going to say we, it could be true and it could be false. We don't know which. But we're going to be able to quantify how much we believe <coughs> that A is true. What is the probability that A is true? What is our degree of belief that A has this certain truth value? Okay? And, and the quantitative rules are, are sort of the rules for manipulating these symbols and manipulating these quantities, which he, he, goes through, he goes through great lengths in the reading to not call them probabilities until we get to the very end. Um, but so, but I, I probably will kind of mess them up. So, 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 um, he goes through great lengths to, to um, um, so, so basically what we're trying to do is assign quantities to our degrees of belief and then find quantitative rules for how to manipulate those quantities in a consistent way. So, so in, in the desiderata was sort of what we wanted to have in those rules. So then here are other plausible reasoning rules from last time. All right. So, so we sort of, um, and what he basically says is for, for, for having these quantities, so, so once we, it's like, it's like this idea, like let's maybe we can represent our degree of belief by a number. Well, what would we want to be true of, the, of, of this inference system to make it work? 
So, so these are the desiderata. What are some of the desiderata he came up with? We talked about them last time. Yep. If you go, you can get to the same place by two different paths, you should come up with the same result. Yeah, consistency is what he calls it. So if, if there's two different ways of coming up with one of these quantities of the degree of belief that A is true, let's say, that are logically this consistent. So, so two different paths through the proof tree uh, of, of coming up with two, with, um, two triumphs. You should get the same number. Does that make sense? Why is that a good idea? What would it be if, if that wasn't the case? What would happen? Yeah? I mean, the probability that you got would just sort of be arbitrary based on whatever path. Yeah, it would depend on which path you decided to pick uh, in, in terms of making your inferences about where these numbers come from. So we want it to be the case that no matter which way we decide to compute these numbers, they're the same, as long as we start from the same premises. Um, consistency. So what's, a, what's another one? There's one that's kind of almost more basic than, than that. Yeah? Not ignore any of your evidence. Not ignore any of your evidence, yeah. So, so we don't want to arbitrarily decide to ignore information that we actually have. Now actually, as, as we start to talk about the tricks, we'll do that all the time. Um, we, we, will, we will gratuitously ignore lots of lots of information. Um, sometimes it's called randomization. Like, like um, he has this really funny paragraph about randomizing things in the next chapter where like, like so, so a very classic problem in this is like something called the Bernoulli urn where you're like you have a, bo a box of balls and you're drawing red balls or blue balls out and you want to know what's the probability that I'm going to draw a red ball next. So sampling without replacement is I reach in and I pull something out. I reach in I pull something out. Sampling with replacement is I put it back in and then shake it up and then and then draw something else out. So, so, so sampling with replacement involves doing something really complicated, like randomly shaking all the balls around. And exactly you know, what ball I pick is going to depend on all the specific ways that I shake the urn, right? Um, and if I really want to incorporate, find the best estimate I can of what ball I'm going to pick next, I would do that. Like I would, I would, I would use all of that information. But it's really, really hard, and, and that's sort of what like the ideal math world would tells us to, we should be doing if we really want to um, compute good inferences. Uh, however, it's really hard to do that, right? Like like all this physics, and it depends on the exact shape of the urn, and how do we specify it all. So what we do instead is decide to forget about all of this information, and the math gets a lot simpler. So, so, so we see this trick of deciding to forget things happening a lot to make the math easy, to make our computations easier. That's what's driving a lot of, our, of the tricks that we're going to play. And we'll talk next time in the next class about some specific ways that that happens. But in math world, when we derive these rules of inference, we should have, in principle, some way of taking into account all of the information that's available to us. All right, I forget what else is, is left, so let's see. Well, so the first one is, is, is we're just going to, just, he just says, like, let's re represent degrees of probability as a number. So, so we, maybe we could have picked discrete let sets. He's looking at, like, multi-valued logics and stuff like that. But let's just see what happens if we use numbers, uh, real numbers. Um, so then this is, a lot of stuff is in this one. So qualitative correspondence with common sense. This is the one he goes to when, when uh, all else fails. There's, and and it, it, a little bit of it is, is kind of magical because he kind of just decides this is what common sense would tell you. But we basically want these rules to agree with what a rational person would say given all the same information. Um, and, and, and that's used a, a lot in the chapter to, to derive uh, what we want things to be. And then consistency. So there were three parts to that. So if a conclusion can be reasoned out in more than one way, then every possible way should lead to the same result. Otherwise, these numbers don't really mean anything because you could, you could decide to do it this way, I could decide to do it that way, and we could argue with each other. And never, there's no way of settling it. So we want to come up with rules that are con lead to consistent reasoning. We want to all take into account all of the evidence that we have. And again, like if, if we doesn't take into account all of the evidence that we have, then you could decide to pay attention to this evidence, and somebody else could decide to pay attention to this other evidence, and we could fight about it. And sometimes people actually do fight about it because we, we have these tricks that ignore stuff. But in math world, in the sort of elemental form of these rules, in the pure form, we want to take into account all of it. And then um, finally, we represent equal states of knowledge by equal plausibility assignments or probability assignments. So it's basically saying that there should be some kind of scale for these numbers. 
we're going to represent degrees of belief by real numbers, and the same number should represent the same degree of belief. So, so this kind of setting it all into one scale. Otherwise, like we could, like you could pick one scale, I could pick another scale, or today the robot could pick one one number to represent. I have no idea, and tomorrow I could pick another number to represent. I have no idea, and there'd be no way to compare it. So, um, so, so this is another consistency requirement. So, so now what we're going to do is, is sort of take these rules and just try to explore <laughs> the space of possible rules for inference that we can come up with using these rules. So, so the first um, thing I'm going to show you guys is a little bit of notation. So this is um, sort of what he's using in, in the chapter to avoid actually giving you probabilities. So, so this is the, supposed to represent the plausibility, the probability of A and B, the expression that A is true and B is true, given that I know C is true. And this is something, so this is in R, right? It's some real number. Um, so all the time when he's writing this notation in, in, the, in the book, he, in, the, in the chapter, he's, uh, you can just translate this to some real number. And that's right now, at, at this point, that's all we know about it. Uh, and that co comes from our first rule, right? We just decided we're going to use numbers. OK. So the first thing that he, he tries to do is write this quantity in terms of other component quantities. So what component quantities could we use in, in doing this? I mean, some of you, I mean, so we can probably, we could just write down the answer. We kind of know that maybe, maybe I will write down the answer so there's not like mystery about it. So, so this is the product rule. So probability of A, B given C equals the probability of A given C times the probability of B given A and C. And it also equals the probability of B given C times the probability of A given B and C. So, so what we're going to do, so, so this is what we're going to get to at the end. How many of you have seen this before? Most of you, right? Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do for, for the next few minutes is kind of ask ourselves where this comes from. Why uh, were these rules just handed down from on high as, as, as the two things? Like, like, so, so, so first of all, what are other rules that we could have? It's OK that they're wrong. They're, they're, like, the, what he's going to show is that they all, are, they all are wrong, in fact. But what are some other wrong rules that we could come up with? Yeah? We could just add them instead of multiplying. Sure, yeah, we could add them instead of multiplying. So we could say A given C plus probability of B given A C. What else? Yeah? Probability of A given C plus probability of B given C. What else? Yeah? Probability of A and B. Probability of A and B with no C. Yeah, we could decide, forget about C. OK? We could do a lot of stuff. And, and, and this one is nice because we can kind of see why, why is this not right? Because we're ignoring some information, yeah. Um, but, but these other ones, maybe it's not quite so obvious why they're not right. There's also other quantities we could use. So let's keep uh, multiplication as our, as our form. What are other quantities that we could get from A, B, and C um, using this sort of notation? Yeah. C given B, A? Yeah, C given <laughs> B, A. What else? B times C. B times C. A, B, probability of A, B times probability of C. A. B, well, I think it A, B alone without given C. I could get C alone, right? So I could go through, and he talks about how there's 11 different ways you can get these different functions. So why are these two the ones? What, what, what privileges these two? We'll talk about it. So, so this is sort of the question that I want to, I guess what I'm trying to do in, in this is, is try to make you guys question why, where these rules come from. And realize that they're not that there are other things that we could 
it could, it could be the, the true rules of inference that could lead to consistent reasoning. They don't, but it's not like these are the only possible things we could come up with. So here's my slides for that. So, so now we're going to sort of talk about where we can get the, the product rule. Um, so, so what gives rise to it? So, um, so, so the reasoning that, that he gives is that it, it basically comes down to the structure of the logical expression of AB. So, so what do we know about AB? So, so what do we know if A is true? Somebody else, yeah? And the probability of AB is the probability of if A is true. Right, so let's, not, let's think in logic world. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so the truth value of AB, if A is true, then we, so the, and A is true, then, then the only thing we need to know about is B, right? So now what about if B is true? B. Then what's the truth value depend on? A. A, yes, that's right. So we can kind of go in either direction in figuring out what the, what the, what the logical, logical rules are. So, so I'll put this up on the, on the slide here. So we can, we can first figure out if A is true, given C. And then, once we know that A is true, because we figured that out already, we can figure out if B is true, given that A is true, and also C, which is our background knowledge. Um, and we could do it, it's symmetric, right? So, so because product is commutative, we could go AB, AB equals BA. Then we could figure out first if B is true, and then we can go in the other direction and come up with A, divide, uh, a given B and C. So, so writing this insight that you could go in either direction in a general way mathematically, you get this functional form for the, for, for, for the relationship between A, B given C in terms of these two simpler, not, I don't say simpler, but these two other components. So, so we haven't said, so, so here's like, like the end with multiplication, we haven't said what F is yet. All we're saying is that it has to be th that there exists some function that takes as input b given c and a given b and c and returns the plausibility. So does everybody make they kind of get why that why that makes sense? And I could do it in the other direction too. I think I have that up there. Yes, and and that function I it works in the other direction. And those two functional expressions have to be equal. F could be right now whatever I want. It could have square roots and e's and who knows what else. Um, as long as it, uh, this, this property holds. So, so again, I want to I ask you guys to think about other functional forms. So, so the first group we're going to talk about is, is what if we just um, take, so, so in, this, in, the, in the book, he, this is where he's talking about u, v, w, u, v, w, x, and y. Um, so, so, so we can take a, b given c and come up with other combinations of these variables that, that correspond to all correspond to logical expressions and therefore they all have some number associated with them that represents the degree of belief of that predicate. And, and we can ask ourselves whether the, the, these, these expressions are, are, could hold, whether they could make sense. And this is where he's kind of relying on the, the idea of qualitative correspondence with common sense. So, so um, what you can do is just write down all of the different functional forms you could have. So, so it turns out that there's, uh, these are the ones of one variable, and these are the ones of more than one variable um, for, for, for our function. And you can just enumerate them all. That's, that's what I'm doing here, with, with C always being given, so we're not trying to mess around with C. Um, and, and then ask ourselves, one by one, which ones uh, basically, one by one, go through and try to find counterexamples. Why do these rules, why does this functional form violate the, do these functional forms violate the, the rules of common sense? So, so for example, um, this, this is one of the ones he gives as, as an example. So, so, so for this one, we can imagine that A is the probability that the, 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 the statement that the next person who comes in the room has blue eyes. And B is the statement that the next person who comes in the room has brown eyes. 
So, so it's reasonably likely that, that either one of those could be true. It's, it's not something that seems like radically unlikely. However, if A and B were both true, then, then the plausibility of, of somebody coming in with one blue eye and one brown eye, let's say, is really, really low, right? What's that? Question? Oh, there is. So, okay, so it's not zero, but it's really, really low. And we could construct an extreme case where it is, is zero. Like we could say both eyes are, are, um, are this color. So, so what that means is that making this function, um, this, this function here of blue eyes and brown eyes without um, putting the, the other predicate in the, in the given side doesn't really make sense. Because we come up with this, we can come up with this counterexample that violates the the rules of common sense. Does that make sense to everybody? So, so what you can do is is um, come up with these kinds of counterexamples for the other functional forms that that aren't the product rule, basically. So, so what I'd like you guys to do right now is um, turn to a partner and pick one of the ones that's wrong. And then come up with a counterexample, um, like the one that, he, that, that we just did with blue eyes and brown eyes, that kind of shows why it, doesn't, why it violates the rules of common sense, why that functional form isn't going to work if we want our, our reasoning to, to mimic what, what a human would do. Go. You guys done? Yeah. All right. So I'll highlight the two that are that are right. That are hopefully you didn't pick those. So who wants to share with with uh, the class what what you guys came up with? Nobody. Yeah. Oh. You kind of had your hand raised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys want some more time? Maybe no. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess we did the one right above the second yellow one. This one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's probability is the plausibility of A B given C equals F of B given A C F of A given B C. This one. Okay. So B given A C and B given C. We're saying we get that B that twice. If we if B was just B didn't care what A was, but B was very probable for just C it would say, yeah, it's very probable that A and B are true, even though C might just be true. It does, it, you don't have any information about A, how probable A is. Right. Yeah, so can we go with like an example? Like, if like blue eyes and brown eyes? Yeah. I don't know. Like, <laughs> the sun is shining, like, yeah. C is the sun is shining and B is, the earth is being hit by sunlight. Yeah. It's like very, very, but A is like, it is raining. Uh huh. So, like, if you're given C, it's very, it'll just say, yeah, it's very probable that it's raining. 
Like that the sun is shining. Yeah. Right. So like if A and B really have nothing to do with each other, there's no way for it to take into account that, that that's the case. Somebody else want to? That's good. Thank you. Does somebody else want to share? Go team. Go team. <laughs> somebody else want to share their example? <laughs> yeah? So like the very bottom one will actually like the whole collection underneath this yeah. yellow. Yeah. All have sort of too much information. Let's say you could yeah. provide contradictory information. Like uh, in that sense, if you have any two yeah. ones on the board, yeah. can, if you have three, you can get to the other one. Yeah, so these aren't exactly wrong because you could just decide to ignore one of your arguments. But, but, if, you but if you gave, gave yeah. In, um, yes. Different things which were contradictory. Yes. And then it would depend on the inner working of the function. Did How it broke. The right answer or not? Yeah. Which right answer so, so what would that violate? Uh, consistency. consistency. Yeah. So, so I'm giving kind of redundant information here. So, so I'm giving B given A and C, and I'm also giving B given C. So, so if let's say that. Um, B, I don't know, like B given C is really, really implausible, but then B given A and C like is really, really plausible. Then it's gonna, uh, I, 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 I need to make sure that these two numbers are somehow consistent to make it kind of work. So I, I could, if I didn't make them consistent, then I would get this inconsistent. And by making them consistent, you can basically say, well, I just don't need that argument, and it gives you back to the other one. Somebody else in the back? Uh, the one above the second yellow one, if A and B are things that are very likely to happen with each other, uh -huh. then you can't really express A and B given C. Like, for example, if A was it is snowing and B is it's really cold, Yeah. and C would be the earth is round, <laughs> of course, B given AC and A given BC both have a very high probability because it usually snows. Yes, cold. yes. But you can't tell what the probability is it's snowing and being cold given that the earth is round. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, so, so if A and B are really correlated, like they always, always occur together, um, and, and then, then, then these are both going to be big numbers, but then, uh, but, but th that doesn't mean that A and B are necessarily big numbers, because it might be summertime, and then it'd be very unlikely to be snowing. Um, so, so, so that's why um, this one violates the rules. And he actually, like, he doesn't actually go through all of these in the book, he offloads it to some other, uh, some, somebody else who actually go, like, goes through each one of these other alternative forms. And, and just like we've been doing in class, comes up with a counterexample. Um, and, and more formally in math, what, what, what it works out to, to be saying is, I can find some situation, some C, like C is the knowledge that A is false, for example, or C is the knowledge that A implies not B, that causes uh, these, all these other forms to, to, to return something inconsistent. Whereas these two, because they're they're sort of cons they're sort of following the rules of logical deduction, um, they work. So 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 right now, what we can sort of say about f is we uh, is, is uh, about this these two quantities is related by some function f of of these two numbers. I think I was on the other form. No, I didn't. Um, and and of course it's it's uh, it works if you if you pick a instead of b to go first. So the next. Um, thing in our investigation is what else can we say about f given our desiderata at the beginning of, of class? So what are some other things we could say about f? What's that? Yeah, what are, what are some different constraints we could try to prove about f? Even if they're wrong. <coughs> that what? It can't be addition. Yeah, that's good. So, so we could try to say f can't be addition. F can't be ac so if f so so we can write it as as with just f of x y doesn't equal x plus y. We could try to prove that. What else? Better take in and give out real numbers. What's that? Yeah, that's good. So, so f better take in and give out real numbers. So f of x, y should be in, should I should say, should be in r, and x had better be in r, and y had better be, I got that wrong, in r. Yeah. Same information, so 
because the, if you switch the input set app, it should be the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's really good. That's, that's like sort of the key to, to, to saying more things about f. So that's called associativity. So, so what's associativity in arithmetic, say? If I have like x plus y plus z. Yeah? Yeah, I can put the parens wherever I want, and I'll get the same answer. Let's say w. And that is going to be the same thing as x plus y plus z equals w. It better not matter. So, so um, is f associative? Can we prove that f is associative? It has to be associative. Yeah? It wouldn't be consistent if it weren't associative. Right, exactly. So, so if I decided um, in my, so, so here um, is, an, is an example. If I decided, I can decide to break this down, if I'm doing ABC now, there's three propositions given D. I can decide to break this down in a couple of different ways, right? I could decide to say F of BC given D um, and F of A given BC and D. And then I can go and break this one down again. Um, so, so, so what does that look like if I break this one? I see you. <laughs> Somebody else. Yeah, so what am I going to pass them to? F. Yeah, I'm going to call F again. So, so yes, like what you said. So I could do it in, in, in a different order. So here I'm calling F again, right, for this one. I'm just applying the same rule that we came up with before twice. And then I could do it in the other direction. So here is um, breaking it down in a different way with C instead of A going first. And I'm free to do that because logic is associative. Logical product is associative. And then I get this expression. And if I, if I, and, and, and what these are saying is that this and this have to be the same quantity. So, so you were talking about consistency, right? I want, no matter which way I decided to break it down, I want this and this to have the same quantity, the same numerical value. So if I set them equal to each other, and I use x's and, and y's and z's instead of the, the a's and c's to, to represent those quantities, those degrees of belief, this is what I get. This is like the associativity equation. So does addition satisfy this? Yes. Yeah. Multiplication? Yeah. Subtraction? No. Yeah. So, so there's lots of functions that satisfy this, right? There's, there's all this, I don't really know group theory at all, but like that's what people think about. Like um, they study classes of functions that satisfy the, 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 the rule of associativity. So, so we know um, that somehow our, our rule for combining these degrees of belief has to be associative, just like addition and, and multiplication. So that makes addition and multiplication good candidates for, for what our f should look like. But there's lots of other functions that, that would work as well, anything that's associative. Cool. OK, so, um, so, so what they do in, in math is, is they give a bunch of like calculus here, which I'm not going to do in, in class with you guys today. And, um, and, and take some derivatives and stuff. And what they basically show is that in order for something to be associative, this is a general result for, for anything that, that's, that's associative, you have to be able to define it in terms of these primitive function, this, this other function f, where w inverse of w of x uh, and y is, is, is what f is. And I get to pick w to be whatever I want. So I'm not sacrificing the generality of f beyond what I've already put in terms of uh, associativity, I'm just saying instead of defining f as a black box, what I really need to define is w, and then I, I can put it in this form and, and give me f. And then, um, and then what uh, the next step is, is to write the product in uh, uh, w of this quantity in terms of uh, using our definition of w um, as a logical product. So, so this basically falls out of of knowing that the, the, the logical product is associative. So, so we, we skipped some math in, in here. Um, and, but but, but the, the gist of what all that math was doing was saying we can write f in terms of this thing w. And once I, a, and once I have w, I can write my, uh, my a, b given c in terms of multiplying w's together. 
So this is the product rule with W instead of P. Is that kind of cool? Yeah? How many arguments is W taking? W is taking one argument. Yeah, I don't actually know. Let me pull up the book. <coughs> that does look like a bug. Um, w inverse takes two arguments, then W produces two arguments. Yes. W inverse takes four arguments. Oh, yeah, it's supposed to be logical product. It's okay. supposed to be product in there. Sure. Thank you. So I will fix that. Uh, thank you. Nice catch. So is that better? So, so I just took out the comma. This is supposed to be W X uh, uh, times W of Y. Does everybody like that? I think it's kind of cool. Like that you can start from, from, from the, these very basic assumptions and you can get to the product rule. So, so the next thing I think is even cooler. Um, so we're going to think about what happens. We're going to actually go from, from, from this function, which, which right now, are, like we've gone from having to pick f, which is this two argument function that was arbitrary, to picking w, and then we can define f in terms of our, of our w. Now we're going to actually t think about what values w has to have at cert for certain conditions in order to satisfy our rules of, of inference. And the way that we're going to do that is by thinking about extreme cases. So, so cases where we know for sure that something is true in cases where we know for sure that something is false. So the first thing is um, we're going to think about certainty. So, so in, our, in our P of A given B and C, let me erase the board. So in A, B given C, what do we know? So, so what if A is certain given C? So, so we're going to get to like that W has to be one, but but let's not jump ahead to to, to the answer. So, so so what do we know about um, A B given C as a as a logical expression? What is it equal in logic if A is certain? <coughs> a and B is A is certain, and and we have A and B. Yes. Uh, B given C. Yeah, it's equal to the value of B given C, right? We know A is true, so. Um, so, so whether that whole expression true is true only depends on whether B is true. That makes sense? Just logically. Okay. So, so the next thing um, we can do is, is let's think about the, the plausibility. Let me look at my notes. Wait, should I do this right? B, A given B and C. So, so now we know that uh, A is true, logically. given C. So what does that have to equal? One. Yeah, one, but, but logically. Logically, it has to be true. And, what it, and, 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 and now let's think about plausibilities. What, what quantity kind of, what, 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 what numbers have to be equal to in terms of our plausibility real numbers? We're going to get to one, but it is true. Yeah, we'll get to that. So, so what I'm looking for is a given c. So, so what this is saying, without jumping to, to yes, it's going to be one, and we'll we'll get there in a second. Um, but without without jumping ahead, what this is saying is that if I know for sure that a is true given c, for sure, then no other additional information can change my degree of belief about that fact. Okay. So, so no matter what B is, I don't care what, you, what other stuff you tell me, my, my, my eyes are closed, I don't need to pay attention to it at all, because I just know that um, it's equal to the plausibility of A given C, which is certainty. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll, we'll get to one. You guys, you guys aren't wrong, but we're, 
I, I want to just break it down so you can see that it kind of comes out. It's not something that, come, that we put in. It's something that comes out of, of these rules. So now let's try to write our associativity rule. So W of A, B given C equals, I'm gonna make sure I write it in the right way. W of A given B, C, W of B, is that right? Given C, yes. Okay, so now what we're gonna try to do is, is come up with the form of this given, given these two assumptions. So without substituting one and, and, and stuff yet. So, so, so what do we know about W of A, B given C? What is it equal to? W of B given C, excellent. B given C. And what do I know about, about W of AB, W of A given BC? Yes, but, but so yeah. So let's just substitute it in and then, and then uh, we can see, so, so, so I hear people saying that it must be one. Why must it be one? Now, now when I write it in this form, maybe you can see, like, like for those of you who haven't jumped to the conclusion, why does it have to be one? Yeah, that's right. So, so isn't that amazing? Like we started out with these completely undefined functions that we got to pick to be whatever we want. But now we, we've, we've proven that W of B, C, or W of A given C has to be one. Certainty just comes out of this. One representing certainty comes out of this. So we've gone from these arbitrary functions to a number for, for, for what certainty has to be. I think that's really cool. Yeah? There's also like a sort of trivial light of thought where you say it would, W, B, given C is always just false for any B and C. It's just always zero. Mm -hmm. Well, so we're going to do impossibility next. So let's... But the, like, let that equation would also work if yeah. W of B given C is zero. Yeah. Right? It would just have to be zero for everything. Yes, if everything was... Yes, you're right. So, so there's a trivial solution to this, is, is what you're pointing out. Um, and, and the trivial solution is that W of X of x equals zero for all x, okay? Um, but that doesn't really help us in terms of our, of our, of our rules of, of reasoning and stuff. You use the, like, it should agree with yeah, yeah. common sense. Yeah, so, so if we want to, to get, uh, I mean, otherwise, it's, not, it's never going to make any inferences at all. It's just going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is zero. It's very sad. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so yeah, we, we use that we want to qualitatively agree with common sense. We don't want a robot to just always say, I don't know, because it wouldn't be a very useful robot. And why are we, you know, busting our heads doing all this math if our robot's always going to tell us zero, no matter what? So we reject the trivial solution, although, he, it, it, you know, it, it, it's definitely worth thinking about it. Um, and uh, so, so if you reject the trivial solution, then, then you have to say W of... A given C, given that, that, that um, we know that that's true, it equals 1. So we get this out of our axioms. All right, so now let's talk about impossibility. So, so what if A is impossible given C? Whoa, okay, my slides aren't. All right, so what if A is impossible given C? So, so now how can we write AB given C? So, so we get, we're going to get to like, you know, what the number has to be. Although in this case, it's, uh, it, so we're going to talk about like whether, um, it doesn't have to be zero. So, so, so we get to choose. Um, so first of all, let's just write it in terms of, of, of our logical expression. What does the degree of this belief have to be equal to? If, if we know that A is impossible. Yes. So, so, so to see that, so this equals the plausibility of A given C. So if we know that A is, is false, does it matter what, what value B takes on? No, because that product is always going to be false. The, the logical product there is always going to be false. So it doesn't matter what B is. Um, okay. So now let's think about A given B, C. A given B, C. So, so um, what is this one equal to? A given C again, right. So same thing. Like if we know for sure, for sure, that A is false given C, no additional information matters to us. We already know it. We already know the answer, and, and we can just ignore um, the contribution of B. 
Unless now, now we could have like inconsistent states, right? Where like we could have a world where A and not A are both true, and then and like, like B might be the, the information, like C C C would tell us that A is false, and B might be the the statement that A is true, and then we get to a logical inconsistency and we crash. So we're we're, we're not taking into account information like that. But assuming we're in a logically consistent world, then you have to you can ignore whatever B is. All right. So now we're going to do the same trick. Uh, as before. So we're going to think about the product rule. W of A, B given C equals W of A given B, C times W of B given C. And let's try to rewrite it. So, so, so in this world where we know that A is false, what is this equal to? W of A given C. Right. And now in, um, in this world, what are, what are the other two terms? So W of A given B, C, A given C times W of, so that one doesn't change, right? Why doesn't this one change? There's no A. So we don't know anything about it. We can't, we have to just leave it alone. So now th the question is, um, <coughs> there we go. So what do we know about W of A given C to make this be true in the world where, where it's, it's false? So we can come, come, co go from this to a number. What's, what's, what's the number? Zero. Yeah. Um, so, so if w of a given c, a given c equals zero, it doesn't matter what this is. The whole thing is going to be zero. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because if, um, if a is false given c, it doesn't matter what b is. So it, 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 the zero makes it all go away. It doesn't matter how plausible or unplausible b given c is. Once we know a, is false given C, um, we can ignore it. Question. If, if B given C is one though, don't you not, you're not necessarily able to solve it that A given C is zero? Yeah, so, so why is, is uh, <laughs> so, so, what's, so, so, what, so what did you do? So you said A given C is false, B given C is true for sure. So, wait, is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. So now what is, just in, just in, in logic world, what is A, B given C? A and B, where a, B is true for sure and it's false, yeah. So, 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 so if this was one and this was zero, what would the possibility you're doesn't, doesn't it being zero already presuppose that we solved it to like lack of certainty to be zero? Or like it being impossible to be zero? There's another trivial solution where the movement always says, yeah, that's probable. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Yes. Like so there's another trivial solution. But 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 going back to your question, I, I maybe say more things and maybe I can help more. Well, so yeah. So supposedly we just solve for impossibility being zero, right? Yes, I think we did. But we could, it seems just as easily we could have solved for, we could have not been able to solve for it by B given C being certain. And then you're, but then we're like, oh, well, <coughs> if B given C is certain, A given C is impossible, then you have a zero and a one. So A given C is zero, which seems very circular. Like you can't use the A given C as zero in trying to explain why, like, why? Yeah, I think I see. I think I see what you're saying. So, so if you, if if I if I also took as my axiom that B given C is true, then I wouldn't be able. I could come up with any value for. I could. I see what you're saying. So I could come up with any value for A given C, and it would work, because this would be one. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So so, um, but critically, I'm not assuming that. Okay, so so even though in the in the in that one case where I know that B given C is true, that one case doesn't give me any constraints. But all the other cases where any other number besides one, so first of all, do you think that we could assign other numbers besides one to B given C? That like we're allowed, we're, we're thinking of all the possible degrees of belief we could have about B given C. We want this to work no matter what we think about B given C. We don't want to have to assume that it's true or, or false. We want it to work all the time. 
so that this is exactly what we had written before, we get a different conclusion because we're very B given C, not A given C. That's right. Yes. Does that, does that make sense? Does that help? No, it makes sense. Yeah. But I, I, it's kind of unclear to me why exactly we're, we're privy to assuming that it's necessarily not one. If you assume we're, we're one for every possible case, right? And, yeah. And, like, and so it's like your robot just always says one. Right? That's what I mean. It's another trivial solution. Mm -hmm. It would be internally consistent in that all of your properties you want would merge, but none of the usefulness would. Yeah. <laughs> but we should be, these properties are supposed to be dropping out, or, or, or like these numbers yeah. are supposed to be dropping yeah. out these properties, but it seems just as easily that they couldn't. If well, we tried to solve it in this way. If we let uh, W of B given C be a set, it just works. Just be the set of all possible values that B given C could be. What we want is, yeah, yeah. So we're we're trying to write something. We're trying we're trying to find out what a given c has to be, so that this equation is true, no matter what w of b given c is for all the different values that could that it could take, including one. So 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 if we decided at the beginning that we're, that we're going to assume that b given c is true, then our proof wouldn't go through, okay? Because we've only proved it like like as soon as you got a different value of like we, uh, like you're saying we could pick some other value that's not uniquely set. But in the case where we don't assume that it's one, we we, we try to take make this equation be true for all the different values of W of B given C. Then then we get a, a constraint on uh, on W of of A given C. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, we actually, it's not just, it doesn't have to be zero. It could also be infinity. <coughs> okay, so, so he, and he makes this point in the book that, um, you, like, that also would work as, as a convention. So our probability is where one is, was, is certainty and infinity is, is um, maximally uncertain. Uh, but it, it's basically just a decision that the people made to make the math r notationally uh, more efficient. But all the theorems would go through if we decided to take the, the um, absolute uncertainty to be infinity. And we sometimes do that, actually. In, in our in implementations, people have, how many of you guys have heard of log probability? Some of you? So, so sometimes what, what people do is um, take, uh, t take the log of a probability. And all that's really doing is switching you. And, and, and when you actually write programs to compute probabilities and, and update these de degrees of belief, you often work in log space instead of p space. And what that is go doing is putting you in that, in that other space. The reason we do that is a numerical one. So, so when you have um, lots and lots of possible uh, values for, uh, for, for what you're what, could be, what you think could be true about the world, then the individual probability values get very, 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 very small. So small that they underflow, like they, they, the rounding errors will eat you alive. So when we switch to log space, it's a trick that, that sort of spreads them all out into all of the floats instead of sticking them in between all the floats between zero and one. Um, does that make sense? Um, so, so there's a finite, even though reals are, are uncountably infinite, there's a countable number of floats that we can represent in 32 bits. In, in the computer, and there's a lot more of them the, um, between minus infinity, whatever, it's not infinity, it's whatever the minimum float is to the maximum float, than there are between zero and one. So it's a trick. We often, computationally, we work in log space. Um, but the math, kind of, um, by convention, zero is, is when we're sure that it's false, and one is when we're sure that it's true. Um, so I think this is really amazing, like, like that we can get to actual numbers. Um, even if, if uncertainty we get to choose, like we still get to choose between two things, and one of them is infinity, so it kind of makes sense why we don't use it. All right. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about, um, and we're going to go a little faster through this, is the sum rule. So the, um, the sum rule, uh, maybe I'll write it down in in the first place is P of A given, is it, am I using B or C? A given B plus P of not A given B has to equal one. Um, and, and basically what we want to do is, is, is derive this rule, or what he does in, in the book is derive this rule from our, our same first principles. Um, so so we, we, we know because A and not A 
can't be true at the same time. Otherwise, we're in that logically inconsistent world where, um, where, where we, don't, we can prove anything, right? If A and not A are both true, then, then our world doesn't make sense and we're stuck. Um, so, so given that we know that, that those can't be true at the same time, we can relate our degrees of belief about those statements. If we're more sure that A is true, then we have to be less sure that not A is true, and, and vice versa. So that's what this function is saying, right? So, so our, our belief about A given B has to somehow depend on not A given B, or else this, this relation won't work. We'll get, we'll get something that's inconsistent with the rules of common sense. And um, basically, what, when, when you write it down in this form and then ask, <coughs> you assume differentiability and, and stuff like that, and you do a bunch of math that you can read in the book, what you get is, is the functional form that S has to take um, to make this be true. So, so it uh, is 1 minus x to the m raised to the power of, of 1 over m. And there's some derivatives and stuff in there. Um, but this is, this is you know, kind of looking like you know, it has to sum to 1. Um, and, and then when you write this in terms of w, we can, we can uh, you, get, you get this form of the sum rule, where w, yes? What is m? Good question. Yeah, so, so what is m? So, so let me say what, what it is first. So, so, so m is, an, like notationally, it's an exponent. So I get to pick m to be whatever I want. w raised to the power of m of a given b plus w raised to the power of m of not a given b equals 1. So, 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 so do we really need to do that? Do we need m? No. I see people thinking in their head no. Why don't we need m? Where do we get w from? Oh. Okay, so we just yeah. choose the function w such that we get rid of m. Yeah, right. So w, we already got to pick to be whatever we wanted. Um, and so now we're taking it and raising it to the power of m. Well, you could just undo that by choosing a w that, that takes the square root of itself to the power of m. So, so basically, <laughs> you don't need m. You can, you can still choose w to be whatever you want. Um, so, so this is like the, the sort of magical step where he says, um, so we have the, su the product rule here and the sum rule, which, which um, when, when, you, when you do the derivatives and the integrals and all that, you get this form. But you don't actually need m. You can just pick another form for w and, and make it go away. So we're still, we're not losing generality by saying, well, we don't need to raise to the power of m, because we're still just picking this function to be whatever we want it to be. So now he rewrites the w's in terms of p's. And this is like the, the sort of general form of the sum rule and the product rule for probability. So this is kind of cool too. Like we have, these are the, the sort of two axioms for, for combining our knowledge about, about what's going on in the world. So now he, he asks a question, and I'd like to ask you guys a question. Are we done? Do we need more rules? It'd be nice to have some more. It'd be nice to have some more. Yeah. So, so, um, so I guess to, to refine that question again, do we need to go back to our desiderata and do some more calculus? Or can we derive the rest of the rules from, from these two rules? And I guess I should have put certain, uh, zero and stuff like that. But like, <laughs> um, so the answer is, is that we can derive the rest of them from, the, from these two. So, so let's do that in, as an example. So, so let's think about the probability of a plus b given c. So, so let's try to write this in terms of some simpler quantities. So does anybody know the answer just from, from like reading a book of formulas or something? So we can sort of see what we're trying to get. Yeah? p of a given c plus p of b given c minus p of a given c. Yep, that's right. So p of a given c plus P of B given C minus P of A. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So we're writing the logical or as, as, a, as a sum of simpler components. And in some people, like if you look at the history of probability, um, one of the people who started out actually started with this as their basic axiom, that, that the logical or could be decomposed into these two things. You may have seen this illustrated with a Venn diagram where this is p of a, this is b of c, and if you add them together, you double count this, so you have to take out one of those values, okay? 
Yeah. Is there something logically wrong with starting that as an axiom, or did we just choose not to? It, James claims that it leads to unclarity of thinking, and I think he's right. So, so what is nice about where we started is that we, we started to think about what does it mean to reason rationally and logically. And, and, and what we're doing is we're saying, here's Aristotelian logic, and now let's try to generalize it. So there's something intellectually pleasing about saying, OK, this is, this is what it means to do common sense rules, to do common sense reasoning. This is what it means to reason consistently. And coming from that to these two primitive rules, and then from that, you get everything else. Um, and, and there's probably some argument you could make to, to do that. But um, it's, it's almost a way of explaining it. Like, so something that's, that I think is often lost when, when people read math or algorithms or descriptions, a lot of it is trying to explain it to ourselves in a way that makes sense and trying to provide us as researchers and as designers with the tools to think about these um, concepts in a way that lets us generalize them to new concepts and do cool things. And, and, and partly, like you guys have to trust me, like I think that this way of thinking about it, the Jane's way, is, 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 a, is, is, is a very powerful way to conceptualize how probability works. And, and other ways aren't, aren't as powerful. And, and the reason, like, so the whole book is called Probability, the Logic of Science. Like, we're thinking about how to, and people, a lot of people talk about, like, probability and symbolic AI, and there's, like, this big war between them. So there's, like, the symbolic AI people who, who do the logical inference that we did it in, in yesterday's class, and then there's, like, the modern statistical people in the other camp who, who do probability. And people act like they're in different, you know, sides of a big war. But really, they're not. Probability is a generalization of logic. And if you see it that way, then you realize that there's, they're, they're actually fundamentally the same ideas. Probability adds something, and that kind of makes your life harder, because you have, instead of just true and false, you have all these real numbers. But it also gives you a lot of power. And so they're not like mutually exclusive things. There's good ideas in both, and you can combine them together to do even more cool things. And that's what we're seeing now at the frontiers of AI, people starting to accept that. And, and take ideas from both areas and, and, and move forward. So that's, that's sort of, in a nutshell, why I think this way of thinking is cool. OK, so, so let's just for practice, let's try to, to derive this formula from our two rules of inference, which are here and here. So um, there's kind of a lot of, of uh, I'm thinking about how much time is left. So, there's kind of a lot of arithmetic in this. Maybe we'll just do it with my, um, with my, with my notes instead of me trying to write it on the right board. So the first thing that um, happens is you, you can basically invert it. So, so, so we're saying this is equal to 1 minus p of not a and not b given c. So why is that OK? Is that OK? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the sum rule combined with um, uh, de Borgen's law, right? OK, so then uh, we can do, um, we do this move. So what is, what is this, ha what's happening here from here to here? Yeah? The Just the product rule, yeah. So, so what we're doing, like I'm kind of giving you the answer because I don't want to search through all the space of formulas live, live in class. But what, what you do to find theorems like this is you just start trying them. So just like we were doing last week with our, with our theorem prover, you just start applying rules and, and, and coming to good stuff. Yes? How can we get to use the Morgan's law if all we're trying to use is the sum rule and the product rule? We also get to use the logical predicates. So, so um, if, we, if we not something, then we can, we can pass it through. So, so all the logical relations still hold. It's a generalization of logic, so we don't lose logic. We still get to leverage it once it's inside of our probability values. We just, in addition, we have these, this probability function, and we know the rules for combining probabilities once we have them. Okay, so 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 that's why we get to use those rules. Um, so you can sort of keep going. He's um, inverting this to say one minus, and then um, simplification. So you get this. And then you can do more things. So, so then this is picking the, the negative and uh, using the product rule again uh, to go down the tree. And then you do 1 minus. And at the end, you get, ta-da, the thing that we wrote down at the beginning, um, this, this rule for, for the logical or. So this is just an example of one theorem that we could, we could come up with given, given these two rules for combining different probabilities. 
And of course, there's lots more that, that we could, you could have. Um, and we'll talk about beige rule, one of the most famous ones next time. So, so, so we can sort of, you know, go to town and have these little theorems and, and, and go back into logical deduction mode and, and just come up with more and more and more of them. And, and people do. And, and you also can, can come up with similar types of reasoning uh, under different uh, assumptions, under, under different specific values of A, B, and C that give you more specific forms for, for what P has to take. So if you've heard of the Gaussian distribution or the Bernoulli distribution, um, there, there's sort of different classic forms for what P looks like given certain assumptions on what A, B, and C actually mean as logical statements. So, so you, can, um, you can sort of do this kind of reasoning with more specific equations and you get lots of hairy math and people have lots of fun doing that. That's a lot of what current research in probabilistic, reasoning probabilistic graphical, graphical models looks like. Um, and we'll talk about one specific instance of that when we get to particle filters. So now let's think about, uh, going back, let's think about deductive reasoning. So um, these were the two that, that we started with as, um, so, so I was sort of saying that, that probability is a special case, or a general, I'm sorry, <laughs> probability is a generalization of deductive reasoning. So what does um, this look like um, in terms of probability. So, so what do I want to ask about? That first uh, axiom. So if A is true, then B is true. A is true, therefore B is true. And here I'll define C for you. So C is defined as A implies B, that first statement. So I want to ask about the, the, the truth value or the plausibility of, of B, right? Yeah? B given AC is true. Yes. So, so B given AC, to start with, B given AC. Yeah, so I'm going to get to, 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 to it true, but let's, let's use the product rule first to... to, to Look a little bit ahead of ourselves. So, so here's the product rule applied to that. So it's probability of AB, AB given C divided by the probability of A given C. Um, and that's just um, writing it and then dividing to, to make it look in that direction. So everybody understand why we started with B given A and C? Because we want to ask about the truth value of B given that we know C, which I defined down here as A implies B, and A, okay? And, and now we're using our product rule to, to write this in, form, in terms of more simpler statements. So now, um, what is it, uh, so, so now we know that uh, A is true. So what does that tell us uh, about this? How can we simplify this? If we know that A is true, given C, or not, yeah? You can treat the probability of A, B, given C as A, given C. Uh, yeah. So A, B, given C, yeah, this is one, and the denominator is also one. So I get one. So this is kind of what I said in words, it's like an empirical demonstration, that if I stick in logic land, where everything is zeros and ones, I can use the product rule that I derived and I can get, I can stay, and it all still stays with zeros and ones, okay? So, 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 so we get that B is true in, in the sense that it takes the plausibility value of one. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. So then let's do the, the other one. So, um, so this is, if A is true, then B is true, and B is false, therefore A is false. So it's plausibility of A, the probability of A, given that B is false, and, and C, which is the same conditional. So what we're going to do is write this in terms of the product rule again, just like before, with negatives. And, and now what can we say about the, the value of this expression? So if B is, is false, then, let's see, did I do this right? 
So if b is false, then that b is true, and then a given c is not here. So look okay, at a given not b and c <coughs> times not b and c. So this is one, right? So let me write it down on the whiteboard, it'll be easier. So P of A given not B and C equals P of A not B given C over P of not B given C. Um, so, so if I know that B is false, then not B is true. Right, so this is one, and um, and then I know so 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 what is the truth value of a given c? So so if not b is false, then this is true. So it kind of um, I think it goes to zero. Is that I'm waving my hands here. <sighs> I wonder if I wrote it wrong. So A given B and C. So A and not, right, okay. Th so th I'm sorry, I just got confused by conditional. So A and not B um, implies, so not B gives us the contrapositive rule, right? So that means A has to be false. So that means this one has to be zero. So the whole thing has to be zero. Sorry for getting a little kerfuffled. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so, so the contrapositive um, is what, um, and, and converting a conditional to an ands and, and ors is what gives us that. Okay, so, so this is sort of saying um, these two rules of deductive logic are the limiting case of probability. So, so the, the sum and the product rules are completely consistent with them. As long as you put zeros and ones for certainty and for absolute certainty and absolute uncertainty, you can just apply the sum and product rules and you'll get the same answers that you would get if you, start, if you stayed in deductive logic land. Um, but then if we go to sort of plausible reasoning, so if you remember from the beginning of class and, and from the beginning of lecture, we we're talking about the difference between the deductive rules and, and the plausible reasoning rules, um, we, can, we can sort of write out what these look like in terms of the product rule. So this is, if A is true, then B is true. B is true, therefore A becomes more plausible. So this is the probability of A given B and C, where, where again C is, is the same thing as before. So here I get um, the sort of, this is a sort of straight up product rule. What I can do is, um, so, so um, B given AC is just one, right? Because I know that, that B is true given C. And um, what that means is this is some number, uh, so, so what I'm trying to do basically is relate the plausibility of A given BC. So, so now that I know this extra information B compared to without knowing the extra information B. Okay, so here's this on one side and here's this divided by this on the other side. So when I'm dividing by something less than zero, range between zero and one, it has to make it smaller, bigger, smaller. The number's bigger. The number's bigger, right? So, so this equality has to hold, okay? So, so when will it be equal to each other, where A given BC equals A given C? Yep. Yeah, where B doesn't give me any new information at all about A. Okay, so, so when they're basically when they're independent. So, 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 so this is like the, 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 the rule of plausible reasoning coming out of the, the sum and the product rules. Um, and we can do it for the other one as well. So, so with, with knots, and then this one is one, and then we get the same kind of division and, and we get this kind of relation where they're equal when, when, when there's no additional information provided by the other predicate. Um, so, so this is sort of the, the, the victory um, of, the, of, of what we were trying to do. Um, by starting with these desiderata of, of common sense, of, of sort of common sense reasoning, consistency, real numbers, and then um, doing a bunch of math, we actually come up with formulas that tell us how to manipulate these degrees of belief 
in ways that capture these intuitions that he, c he starts with at the beginning of, of plausible reasoning, where the logical rules don't tell you anything, but now we can say something about it. We can have bounds on it, and we can actually do computations with it. Um, and we'll talk more about that uh, in the next class. So, so uh, I wanted to briefly talk about the, the, the numerical value section, which I'm not covering in, in class today. It turns out you can get more numbers besides just zeros and one using something called the principle of indifference, um, where if you um, sort of, you, you don't really know which outcome is going to happen. Um, you don't really know whether A or, or not A is true, for example, or, or if you're looking at multinomial <coughs> land, there's like three things that could happen and you don't know which one then the, the rule about equal plausibilities have to have equal numbers gives you principle of this is also called the maximum entropy principle <coughs> um, or, um, or, or the, oh gosh, I forgot. The, the rule that says you should always pick the simplest solution. What is it called? The, the which? Occam's razor, yeah. It gives you Occam's razor. You should always pick the simplest solution. Um, and that also gives you a way to assign actual numbers as soon as you've defined your sample space. So, so it turns out that uh, you can get quite a lot of specific numbers corresponding to these probability functions just from these, these basic axioms. So to summarize, this is sort of what we did. We started out with these rules of possibility, and we got probability. I hope that was fun. <laughs> Thanks, guys.